What if we repeat this exercise for a diverging lens? Now we say we have f equal to negative 0.5. We again start 1.5 meters away and use the thin lens equation. We solve for di, and we get negative 0.375. So we get a virtual image. Our m is the negative of a negative, so we get plus 0.25. Our image is right side up, but smaller than the object. We move closer in. We move to 0.75 meters. Our image distance is negative 0.3, so still virtual. Magnification, still positive, still less than 1. So it's an upright image that's smaller than the object, but it's bigger than it was further away. We keep moving into 0.5 meters. We get an image distance of negative 0.25, so still virtual, still upright, still smaller than the object. Finally, we go into 0.25 meters. Notice we're getting the same results we got for the diverging mirror. Uh, we still get a virtual image, upright image, and smaller than the object. So all the images are virtual if you have a single diverging lens or a single diverging mirror. Now, there are a couple of pieces of the story that I sort of left out. First, when we say we want the spherical cross-section for a lens or mirror, that's not really what we want. It's commonly what we get. Uh, they, the light rays actually don't all focus at exactly the same point. You can see there's sort of a spread here. There's more of a focal region. So for the light rays closer to the edge, they get focused closer to the mirror, the other one's further out. This blurs the image. And what this gives us is what's called spherical aberration, where aberration means uh, our image clarity is gonna be reduced. What we really need mathematically is a paraboloid. So instead of this perfect semicircle, we need it to be cut deeper here. When you're manufacturing these things, it's much easier and therefore much cheaper to make a spherical mirror rather than a parabolic mirror. So if you look at something like, you know, professional uh, grade major observatory, they're going to use parabolic shapes because they're better. For something, even a, a amateur telescope that you might spend a thousand dollars or more on, it's almost certainly going to have a spherical mirror and maybe a corrector plate, kind of like a contact lens at the other end of the telescope to take care of some of the spherical aberration. There's another problem if we have a lens in our picture. We go back to our original idea of a lens. We know what would really happen here if we used prisms. Not only would we bend this light down, but we'd spread it out. We'd get dispersion. So because red light and blue light get different values for the index of refraction, they bend a different amount. There's another equation called the lens maker's equation. The only place we'll use this is in the FET lab. Uh, I don't think I gave you any homework with this, but it, it's not like it's a killer equation. It tells us about the index of refraction of the lens and the surrounding material. So N2 is the lens, N1 is almost always gonna be air or vacuum. Uh, and then here we have radius of curvature of these two things. Now, keep in mind for a symmetric lens, R1 and R2 are the negative of each other. If they were equal to each other, we'd get zero here. That wouldn't make any sense. But what that means is, let's say R1 is the curve this way, and then R2 is the curve this way. One of them is the negative of the other. You may also have heard uh, companies that make glasses talk about high index lenses. What they mean here is plastics with higher values of N. What that can do, if you have a high enough value of N, you don't need to have Coke bottle thick lenses, even if your eyes are bad. They can be thin, uh, just made out of this fancier plastic. Now, the fact that the wavelength depends on, uh, the focal length depends on wavelength gives us something called chromatic aberration. That's something else that has to be corrected. We don't have this for mirrors because there's no index of refraction involved in the law of reflection. What about if we look at your eye as an optical system? Well, uh, if your vision is perfect, light from very far away, so essentially parallel light, is brought to a focus on your retina, and also light from, you know, a book you hold in your lap is brought to a focus on your retina, even though it's spreading out a lot more. If you're farsighted, that means you can see, well, things that are far away, uh, and that means 
you can see there but not close up. Close up where there's more spreading, your lens is basically too weak to focus that more rapidly spreading light onto your retina. It would bring it to a focus you know, somewhere inside your brain if it could get there. You need a converging lens to fix this, to, to bring that spreading back under control. Uh, now, usually the, the prescription, if you happen to know your prescription and you wear glasses, they're never specified by focal length, and the reason is it's non-intuitive. A large focal length means a less powerful lens. A small focal length would mean a more powerful lens. The way they've gotten around this, the optometrists, ophthalmologists, they introduced something called the diopter. This is a unit of optical power, and we define it as just 1 over f. So one diopter would be a focal length of one meter. If you're farsighted, let's say your prescription is something like plus 2.5. Uh, farsighted is what happens to you naturally as you get older. If you're in a pharmacy, you can find a whole rack of reading glasses with these numbers, plus 1, plus 1 1.5, whatever. The larger numbers are stronger, and they'll help bend that light to a focus on your retina. If you're nearsighted, though, that means the lens in your eye is too strong, and it bends the light down to a point well in advance of your retina, and it starts to spread out again because there's nothing to catch it here. So what you need in this case is something to make the light spread out more so it takes advantage of your lens working harder. You put a diverging lens here. So if you're nearsighted, your prescription will be something like negative 2.25, negative 3.25. For some reason, I don't know, uh, you only see these glasses, the negative ones. You need a prescription for those. Anybody who wants to can walk in off the street and get... Uh, reading glasses, you can get the, the positive correction lenses, pick out your own and wear them all you want. Finally, what if we had more than one lens? This is something where the computer that has ray tracing software would be very useful. Uh, if you ever had the misfortune to drop a professional camera lens, or if you just look online for an exploded view of one, you'll see it's not just one lens or two or three. There are a bunch of lenses in there because they're trying to arrange them to cancel out the aberration effects of one with another one. That could be a horrible mess, so we're just going to look at a two-lens system. Let's say both lenses are converging. We've got one large lens, one small lens. We're just going to make a simple refracting telescope. So when we first talked about parallel light, we talked that what we said was light from very far away is considered parallel. How do we know what's far enough? How do we know if we can set object distance to infinity. The thing that sets the scale in our problems is the focal length of the lens or the lenses. So if the object distance is very large compared to f, we can assume the light's parallel. For anything we're going to look at with a telescope, the closest thing we could see is the moon. That's 400,000 kilometers away, and that's ridiculously greater than the focal length of any telescope we could build. So the light coming through the larger of the two lenses, which is called the objective, we consider that parallel. That means it's going to come to a point one objective focal length away. Now, we want parallel light to come out of the smaller lens for your eye because that's what your eye is most comfortable viewing. And the way to get parallel light out of a lens is to put a point source one eyepiece focal length away from it. So the length of the telescope is pretty much focal length of the objective plus focal length of the eyepiece. If we want to approximate the magnification of a telescope, we would do that by writing the ratio of the focal lengths. To get a larger magnification, we could either use a larger focal length objective, which in general means a larger diameter lens, which means more money, or we could get a smaller lens with a smaller focal length. These are actually cheaper. Uh, the problem is you'll see manufacturers that are kind of scummy uh, put in a very small focal length eyepiece so they can advertise very high magnification. It's not usable, though, because of diffraction, which we'll talk about later. Let's do one last example with two lenses. Let's say we've got a converging lens, focal length 0.27 meters, a diverging lens, focal length minus 0.9 meters, and the two lenses are half a meter apart. If our object is 0.4 meters to the left of the converging lens, where's our final image? So first, we use the thin lens equation on the first lens. We have image distance is 1 over 1 over f1 minus 1 over d0. So 1 over 1 over 27 
minus 11.4. That's 0.831 meters. That image will be the object for our second lens. Our image distance is greater than zero, so it's a real image, and it's over here to the right of this lens. If it's 0.831 meters to the right of this lens, that means it's 0.831 minus 0.5, or 0.331 meters to the right of this lens. Now, because we have two lenses, we can actually have a negative object distance for lens two, and we do. It would be negative 0.331 meters. So we go back to the thin lens equation. We've got one over focal length of the diverging lens, which is negative 0.9, minus one over the object distance, which is, as we said, negative 0.331, and we get 0.524 meters. So that means the final image is real, and it's 0.524 meters to the right of the diverging lens. Magnification, we get that from the product of the individual magnifications. So we put in the numbers for the converging lens, the diverging lens. Notice these negatives cancel. But we have a negative uh, here so that our total product of all this is negative 3.29. So that tells us that looking through this telescope, the final image will be upside down and larger than the object.